Is there more pain in store for crypto? Bitcoin is down right now by nearly 5% and has been fluctuating wildly this morning between 29,000 and 30,000. Other cryptocurrencies like Ether and Cardano faring worse, with investors still smarting from the pain investors saw over the last month. Most are wondering whether crypto winter will get worse. Joining us now, we've got Ryan Selkis, who is the Masari CEO, and we've got Yahoo Finance's own David Hollerith as well joining for the conversation. Ryan, first and foremost, we just got to know your perspective on the algorithmic stablecoin debacle that has taken place that is Luna, Terra, and ultimately what that does for the sentiment more broadly around crypto. Yeah, I mean, Terra was a, a unique example. It was very unfortunate. I think it's a black eye for the industry, and it's something that regulators and policymakers will latch on to, unfortunately. Uh, it doesn't change the reality of uh, the broader crypto market and its relative strength uh, in terms of uh, from a cycle to cycle basis. So obviously, we've seen some pain, uh, not just within crypto, but within all risk assets since the Fed started raising interest rates. Uh, crypto certainly has not been spared as, as one of the riskiest assets, one of the assets, uh, asset classes for this out on the risk spectrum. But I think um, with Terra in particular, it's important to keep in mind that this is one experimental currency that got way too big, way too fast, uh, arguably. And it is not necessarily an indictment of the rest of the stablecoin ecosystem, or certainly not the rest of the crypto ecosystem. Um, stablecoins are still one of the killer apps uh, of crypto, the, the fast settlement, the transaction volumes that we've seen that have rivaled uh, Visa in the last year, when you look at stablecoin transactions on Ethereum, for instance. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible, the growth that we've seen cycle over cycle. We've had the luxury of being in a 12-year, 13-year bull market in general uh, in the economy. And uh, within crypto, this is kind of par for the course. We've gone in four-year cycles for you know, basically that entire duration. So this is not really something that's too alarming for those of us that have been around the industry for a while. Um, it is uh, something to, to keep an eye on, and, and, and I'm sure that we'll see some other projects struggle. But the industry in general, when it comes to human capital, when it comes to financial capital and venture capital, has been invested in some of this infrastructure. It's never been in a more solid position than it is today. Yeah. Hey, Ryan, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I, I wanted to get back to sort of Terra, just kind of looking at that model. I know that you sort of uh, published some some insight into maybe the bear case for Terra uh, early on, uh, I guess, the end of last year. And, uh, you know, people uh, when they're financially invested in this, you know, come out of the gate with a lot of different opinions. And uh, the concept of whether or not there was any sort of fraud involved in the project, I think, is brought up plenty of times, you know, plenty of rumors about that. And I, I was curious, uh, you know, what your inclinations were there. And, and basically, if you could sort of, uh, you know, allude to that or maybe dispel that. I don't want to comment definitively either way, because I certainly haven't seen any evidence of fraud. Um, I, I do think that this is uh, Icarus flying too close to the sun. Uh, the, the project got mm -hmm. Uh, extremely large, extremely quickly, the, the total kind of assets that were being barred against the Luna um, uh, crypto token in order to create these stable coins uh, exploded from under a billion dollars in, into the you know, near, near $20 billion threshold in a matter of months. And um, if you look at the history of the project before then, it, it, it actually had a really interesting fundamental usage uh, in Korea in particular that was backing uh, this entire ecosystem and this, the stable coin uh, Terra USD. So, um, you know, more recently things got overheated. A lot of venture capitalists, you know, plowed a ton of uh, money in, into the ecosystem, and um, I think threw gasoline on a fire that was was already burning. Um, and uh, and then we saw what happens when reflexivity works the other way around, and and unfortunately it unwound, and, and a lot of people got hurt. So I do think. Um, it's a it's a teachable moment. It's certainly something that uh, the industry is going to have to do a better job of uh, in terms of disclosures, particularly around the centralized players uh, that are major holders, proponents and, and um, uh, advocates for these projects, whether that's the central foundations, whether that's the percentage. Uh, of these tokens, like we see in the in the public equity markets, um, yeah, there are some analogs that we should pull from securities regulation, uh, even if we're not actually treating all of these crypto assets as securities, uh, just for the, the safety and, and really the long-term health of the ecosystem. And Ryan, uh, shortly after the, the Terra, Terra USD started to sort of collapse, 
you published a, a bill of rights for um, crypto users, uh, and it was more of a proposal, but uh, could you sort of explain that in, in sort of the timing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we don't want the baby to be thrown out with the bathwater and, and some regulators and policymakers that are a little bit more hostile to the industry right now are, are basically looking for any excuse to pull crypto under very tight regulatory regime. Um, many of the folks that are working in policy right now on the crypto side um, are you know, the groups that are backed by corporate entities. Um, and my point in the post was one of the, uh, one of the groups that's left out here is, is the end user. Um, so we need to make sure that when it comes to the ability to uh, self-custody assets uh, and, and kind of own a personal wallet or when it comes to the ability to actually use a decentralized finance protocol um, that those rights are not limited in any way, shape, or form um, by new policy that gets enacted uh, in the U.S. or, or you know, anywhere in the West, uh, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and this really comes down to, you know, constitutional protections, First Amendment, uh, you know, code of speech, Fourth Amendment, you know, no, no unreasonable search and seizures. And I do think that some of these things will ultimately be adjudicated in court because you will see um, more aggressive uh, policies get enacted that, that really kind of push the envelope, push the line here, and try to bring these decentralized uh, protocols under a more centralized hierarchical regulatory uh, regime. Um, that's inevitably going to lead to some conflicts. Uh, on the one hand, because policymakers want to protect people from another terra. On the other hand, the, the crypto proponents, myself included, arguing that this is a natural part of the evolution of any new technology. It's unfortunate. We need to do a better job you know, within the industry and, and helping protect newcomers especially, but you need to allow projects to fail, right? You, you know, capitalist systems uh, have failures and they have successes. And, and I think we've gone way too long, uh, personally speaking, as a country where we've propped up zombie corporations and, and entities that just have not been allowed to fail. Uh, and, and it's created a lot of deadwood in the system. And that's you know, one of the problems that we're gonna be facing, not just within crypto, but within the broader economy the next couple of years. So, um, a little bit of temperance is in order uh, versus uh, reactive policy for one catastrophic uh, collapse of, of a single asset.